Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So a few years back, I, 20 male, had a small two-room flat in a very old building in which you could hear everything. My bedroom was right next to the wall of my neighbor's 27 male flat. He was a stupid lunatic who always played video games until 4 or 5 a.m. And he had some kind of problem with losing an MP. So every time he would lose, he would start screaming, throwing things around and punching the wall. We can be up almost every night. At the time, I was doing two jobs and needed every second of sleep I could get. I tried talking to him on several occasions, but nothing helped. One time, when I was out for work, I even left my sound system running a mix of artillery and machine gun barrages just to show him how annoying this stuff could be. But as entitled people are, it didn't do any good. Fast forward a few months and nothing improved then. I was getting crazy about this. One Saturday night I had a little poker game running in my flat with a few friends. And my neighbor was having one of his usual tantrums. Since I had guests and they didn't like it, we turned off the music. Everybody listened to something different, so there was a good mix of death metal, techno, industrial, and so on. My neighbor was furious at some point and apparently called the police to file a noise complaint. Luckily, when they pulled up, one of my guys saw them driving up as he was out for a quick cigarette. Now comes the fun. We turned the music down before they came up, so when they rang the doorbell and I opened it, they could not hear anything too noisy, just a few guys having some beer and a little poker game. They told us there was a noise complaint from a neighbor saying it was too loud and that this was something constant. We told him we'd been like this for hours. Then I had a genius idea. I asked him if my neighbor called him, which of course they couldn't answer but I knew what was that. So I invited the two cops in and told them I'd show them what real noise disturbance looked like. I led them to my bedroom where one could still hear my neighbor throwing tantrums and I told the cops the whole story. And since they were already here, I would like to file a noise complaint against them. The cops were shocked at the noise you could hear from the other flat that went directly over to his flat to tell him to shut the hell up and that he would get reprimanded by a written letter to keep the noise down and not call the police for false emergencies. I had a huge laugh as the cops came back to tell me to call them when he did something like this again because in this case I will be able to file charges. So long story short, he thought the police would shut me down. Instead it was the other way around. I never slept better than that night and finally I had some peace at home. This is a long story and I'm a mobile so bear with me and can guarantee some grammar and spelling errors. I tried to limit them but mistakes happen. So several years ago I worked as an unarmed guard for a security company that was contracted to watch over a new construction site for a large wind farm. This area was a hilly rural terrain with lots of wind perfect for this kind of project or so I was told by the many contractors on the project. It was also popular with hunters both local and not. The possibility of bullet holes and equipment being the primary concern followed by a long distance by theft and the property had an old dirt road run through it that had been previously open to anyone wanting to use it. This part becomes more important later. I have been working on this site since they programmed on construction and never had any issue until a roll of copper wire was stolen. Our company had assumed that anyone trying to do anything on the site would use the heavily improved road through the site. They were proven wrong when that spool went at the back road. The only other access road that made up behind the property was nearly impassable for anything but four-wheel drive trucks. So it had been considered unimportant beforehand. Needless to say, we moved to two guards minimum overnight. One at the main entrance and one patrolling the site. The other change was that the company who owned the project decided to require every person entering the site to have a badge identifying them. Due to the popularity with hunters, it created some issues due to this road now being the smoothest and quickest way to the backside of the property. The hunters would come and go, but the people who 
owned cabins behind the property were more regularly seen throughout the year. It was one of these owners that became the biggest problem. He was proud to flaunt the office he had previously held and adamant that he had an easement to drive through this property to get to his. It may be different in other areas, but here in easement, ability to drive through someone else's property is given if there is no alternative route available. While there being a road that led out to the public roads from the back of the property, we were guarding this one the case here. The company we were contracted with was actually pretty reasonable, was allowing access, no money involved, and just some personal information, identification. For this particular individual that wasn't good enough, he made a routine of speeding past the guards and refusing to stop. So a gate was installed and kept shut, short of the construction crew starting and ending shifts. One of the other guards let us know that he was trying to get a ticket or get arrested so he could take the owner to court. My luck would have it that he chose one of my shifts to try to run the gate. This shift being the midday on a Sunday with a crew having come in for overtime to fix something in one of the nacelles, a large box behind the blades that had been flagged during testing and couldn't wait for repair. Honestly, not too sure what was going on with that end. With all of that in mind, this gentleman drives up and starts yelling about accessing his property. We have his picture, so I already knew who he was. I pretended not to hear him clearly, giving me enough time to start using the gate in front of him. This is not a fancy electric gate, it's a steel cattle gate that you have to walk open and closed. As I start shutting the gate, he starts driving forward, so I stop and stand in front of his truck. I let the gate swing back open. He tells me to move out of his way, to which I respond that I know he won't risk running me over because he knows he would lose what he's trying to gain. Free and unrestricted access through the property to him. Seeing that I have the advantage, he decides to try a different approach. He made a comment along the lines of just blocking the road until I let him through or call the cops. I pluffed a little in telling him about the crew working on site and said I wouldn't do anything about it. But since they were on overtime on a weekend, I wouldn't stop them from doing whatever they needed to do to be able to go home. Which led to him pushing to get the police involved. And now is where we start to get into the MC. I was given explicit instructions not to call the police on him because all that was wanted was for him to come back during the week to get a pass, which I told him repeatedly to no avail. He decided to keep pushing the police getting cold, which I kind of started to find funny the more he talked about it. He went from simply saying I should call them to more in-depth pushing. He asked if we had a phone in the guard shack, which we didn't, and he asked if I had a cell phone, which I lied and said I didn't, which was more believable considering they hadn't gotten very popular yet. He then said he did, but didn't want to call 911 since it wasn't an emergency, and asked if we had a phone book. Still not sure why we had one, but it was there. He even tried to get me to call the sheriff on him off of his own phone, which I again refused. Not ready to give up, he took it upon himself to call the sheriff's department on himself. Satisfied that the police were on their way, he moved his vehicle aside and allowed me to shut the gate. It was about 30 minutes before the first deputy arrived, since it was a weekend and a remote part of the county they served. Being the security guard, they approached me first. I told him what had happened and that neither my company nor the property owner had an issue with him or what he was doing as he was outside the gate and not blocking anything. The officer shook his head about this guy calling them on himself and walked over to talk to the ex-elected official. It's about this time that the crew that was working came down, asked what was going on and had a quick laugh before heading back home or wherever they were staying. In all about five officers responded to this call and each one gets a laugh about getting a call like this one. It must have been a slow day for them to have so many show off for this joke call and then take another half hour to 45 minutes deciding how to handle it. In the end, they gave him his ticket for falsely reporting a crime or something along those lines. To which I hear him yelling out his window as he drives off that he got his day in court. The officers who had yet to start leaving laughed. I said yeah, he will get his day in court, but it's not going to be the one 
he thinks he's getting. This story happened a few years ago while employed as a police officer in a small, rural 15-man department. Since being a cop, I've never had a strong desire to write tickets. Typically, my limit was 50 miles per hour over before I would even consider issuing a citation. And that might result in a 5 over ticket, 10 over I would get a warning, and I tended to focus on impaired slash uninsured drivers. And the town was a lone stretch of roadway, a couple of miles leading straight to the nearest interstate. Using this road might take a few minutes off your commute to home slash work, depending on the time of the day. The road had a couple of very old homes which had a comfortable distance from the roadway. Speed limit was 55 but not uncommon to see drivers going 15 over. We rarely got complaints. Unfortunately, one summer we had an auto pedestrian fatal accident. A driver was on their way to work in the early hours and hit a small child who wasn't supervised by their crappy parents. Speeding wasn't a factor in the tragedy. Following the tragedy, an order was given that we needed to seriously enforce speeding in the area. The next following weeks, I stop anyone going over the speed limit, even one mile per hour. Now, I still keep to my normal method of issuing tickets, meaning your speed needs to be excessive to get a ticket. Most of these stops consisted of me informing them of the tragedy and the importance of all of us driving more slowly. Most drivers are understanding and see what I'm trying to do. Except a few who file complaints for stopping cars for one mile per hour and inconveniencing them. I get told to tune back on my proactive enforcement and just to be more visible. Great. Instead of looking for bigger issues or interacting with the community, they want me to just sit in my car. So, for the next couple of nights, I park directly in front of City Hall, with my city burns on. When your lights are on, but don't flash. I stay there for hours at a time. I make zero attempt at being a productive officer. And being a vigilant and dedicated employee, I even take photographs to send to my supervisor to let them know I am being visible. Needless to say, I get talked to about my attitude and told to go back to being the normal. Side note, my sergeant later resigned shortly after I did, after some super shady crap happened in the department. Before he left, he gave me an award for the most literal officer ever. <laughs> I still have it. Super side note, I have another short story about malicious compliance when I was told to ticket people for long weeds in people's yards. But that's for another time. So, I'm the son of a police officer, and I usually go on a ride along with him once every few years. This time, however, I decided to go on a ride along with one of the officers from the next town over. I've grown up with the average opinions of cops as a teenager, then as an adult ranging from they are just thugs beating on innocent people to oh, that guy was 100% guilty, while having minimal information on both kinds of events. In recent years, as I get older, I begin to have a much more moderate opinion, especially after what happened on this ride along. I am not a police officer. I live in Connecticut, and it might surprise people to know that we aren't exactly a state filled with rich people everywhere. There are crabby towns, crabby areas in towns, or just generally crappy people everywhere. This is a story about a crappy area in an otherwise average town. Unfortunately, the heroin crisis was at its worst by this time. A bit more backstory on this event. This story is known for some of its seasonal events like most New England seaside towns. As such, we usually get a lot of tourists from out of state slash states or visitors from other parts of the state. This time, however, we got someone who was just pity enough, narcissistic enough, arrogant enough, and entitled enough to cause a near international incident. I was finishing the paperwork I needed to get the ride along, introduced myself to the first officer, and talked with him for a bit. While he finished his starting protocols for the day, checking email, checking to see if he's been left any messages, looking into the current recent incidents, folks. All in all, it was like being with my family member again. He told me the day was going to be a little bit longer because a few people. He got called to the week before, called his number to follow up on an incident. 
a callback. While he was doing this, I offered to pick us up some car-friendly lunch from a sub place I really loved. Little did I know I was about to be followed by one of the worst human beings and I've met a homicidal, necrophiliac, pedophile maniac. For context, if you're brave enough. I'm wading through this nightmare traffic to get to the sub shop. Then I decide to just park at my friend's house so I can walk the rest of the way. Town is rather close and easy to walk in. I get to the shop and order their special for the week. Get some snacks and drinks. Then walk out the door and into a nightmare lady by accident. I apologized and asked if she was alright. She told me she was fine with one of the most monotone voices I've ever heard. I thought maybe she didn't get her coffee or something and just got in my car I was about to head back to the station. While I was putting the subs into one bag and reusing an old beverage tray I got from a restaurant to hold the drinks, I saw in my rear view mirror the nightmare lady taking pictures of my car with her phone. I'm a bit dumbfounded about this and grab all the stuff to get going. I didn't feel like doing anything to escalate things on, but it was pretty much a perfect weather day. I get inside, grab my stuff and walk with the officer to the car he was using. We get in and do the basic clogging crab for his system. When the perfect weather day turns to dark and dangerous clouds in the form of the nightmare lady. I am sitting in the passenger side seat when this maniac began smashing her hand on a window and screeching like a banshee about how she's going to expose a wave of corrupt police in the country, starting with us. My first thought was this woman has been in a serious accident and was hallucinating because her words were thick was what I thought were slurred tones. Turns out she was just from Norway and had a pretty good grasp on the English language but with a thick accent. We didn't find this out until later. The officer got out of the vehicle and politely asked her to seize her assault on a car. She launched into an even more violent tirade and began to shout how she was going to fix the problems with our country by replacing all the police with volunteers from Europe. This continued for another 30 seconds before she began taking a dozen more pictures. After she was done, she grabbed a handful of dirt and threw it at him. Bad mistake number one for her. He moved in to try and arrest her, but she got away in her car which was on the other side of the gate. He radios it in and lets people know there might be someone with a head injury driving a certain car and that she's wearing extremely expensive clothing. The plates came back as a rental car and having more pressing issues to deal with, the call back. He asked if someone else could be assigned to look for this woman. We get going and meet up with his callback. He talks with them for a while and informs me on what's happening while he files a report. It wasn't until he looked in it wasn't until he looked in his rear view mirror that he noticed something alarming. The same woman who assaulted the car was at the callback's house and asking them questions while she had her phone out recording everything. This person had no idea what was going on and thought the woman was a reporter trying to do a case on the uptick in crime in her area. The officer goes blues and tunes, spins the car right around and tries to get to her before she could get away. Unfortunately, she got away again by getting lost in traffic. Some jerks on the road don't think you should pull to the side when emergency vehicles are on sirens and lights and cause problems. For the rest of the day, it was pretty mundane. Until we got back to the station and saw the nightmare lady go in full ballistic with a reporter by her side. She then saw me and the officer I was with and made a straight shot beeline to me and began to shout obscenities I have never thought possible from another human being. She kept insisting how I assaulted her and then raped her in the bathroom of a very public sub shop. Listed off a fake name for me and told the reporter everything with tears down her face. She kept talking about how she was being stalked for weeks by me and my fellow officers as she walked home from work. I need to restate I am not a police officer and never have been nor will be. At this point, the reporter immediately asks me what I have to say to these accusations and when a trial will be. First words out of my mouth were, I'm not a police officer. I never have been and never will be. What the hell is going on? This enrages a nightmare lady. She then pulls out her phone and presents the most painfully edited video I have ever heard or seen in my life. 
The audio didn't even sound consistent. In one case, I could hear my voice cut, then copy pasted, and repeated three times for the same three words. And I saw the most cheesy filter effect ever being used to show the officer attempting to damage the phone. When all was said and done, she looked like she got me and had the deepest grin I had ever seen in my life. I turned to the reporter and said that not only is everything she said false, but that I have multiple witnesses and numerous videos to prove it. The nightmare lady immediately stepped in front of me and with a straight face said, Nothing you have will hold up in court. The police are not trusted and all the evidence will be thrown out. You might as well admit to the crime you committed. When I asked what the hell she was talking about, she launched into this whole rant about how the lock cameras were obviously fake and that police are not treated as a trusted source for courts. It was her word and her evidence against mine. Then, things got good. The reporter cut her off and stated that not only are the cameras in a lot real and always running, but that the officer who was with him was wearing a body cam. Realizing her massive, massive, massive mistake, she attempted to snatch the camera off the officer's body. Big mistake number two. As not only did she manage to grab it and attempt to destroy it by throwing it against the wall, but she then tried to kick him in the nuts and run away. This went over as well as eating a lead salami. She brought her foot up and got it completely trapped by the officer just moving his leg to the side. He then began to arrest her and read her rights. During all of this, she was screaming police brutality, demanding the reporter only show the part of her being pinned down and arrested, and how the reporter has to only release her version of the story. It turns out the nightmare lady was a 19-year-old representative from a non-profit organization based in Norway, which tries to offer aid to prisoners who are unjustly imprisoned worldwide. It's a genuinely good organization, and I've donated to them before. But this nightmare lady seems to think she's a big member with huge overreaching authority. Her justification for all of this is that she thought I was a corrupt officer because I didn't hold the door open for her when I left with my hands full. I found out much later on that she unwittingly confessed to the attorney from the nonprofit how it was all made up and she wanted to get her name in the organization so she could take over the local police and fix them. She was a delusional daughter of a rather radical activist from the 80s in Norway that was basically a spoiled rich brat who didn't think consequences applied to her. The organization distanced themselves from her and I still donate to them because, well, they do damn good work. So this happened a long time ago. It was November 2009 and I was jamming to I got a feeling by the Black Eyed Bees looking for a cheap apartment. I found a great ad on Craigslist and arranged for a viewing. I meet the landlady, a portly shrew with a pity page haircut. I wasn't for the company, however, but for the cheap room. It's not great looking, but it's cheap. So I tell her I'm interested. She tells me the place is mine if I can get a deposit by the end of the day. Sweet. I rip to the bank and grab the 450 bucks needed. A half a month's rent. She and I cross sign a standard lease and ask when I can get a key to move in. And she says, a couple days as a current tenant has yet to collect all their stuff. So I'm sleeping on a couch at a buddy's pad for now. And so I just chill. Seeing sights enjoying the first few weeks in a new city. A couple days rolled by and I hadn't heard from the landlady. So I got frustrated and left a few salty voicemails. But alas, I was ghosted. Finally, she leaves me a voicemail and says she's sorry, but she cannot rent a place to me. I start to get angry, but I'm a pretty cool customer, so I do the research, find out my rights in an unfamiliar new municipality, and discover that if someone backs out of a lease without a legal reason, the other party is entitled to double the deposit they placed. So I figure she owes me about $900. I leave more messages and emails, again with the ghosting, not answering the phone, no responses via email either, and I just got fed up. Now, I had just accepted a new job, but it didn't start until the turn of the month. I would guess it's about the third week of November 2009. I have some spare time, so I hop on a bus, buy a magazine, 
I sit at the bus stop across from the rental house and just wait. For a couple hours I waited, but man, was it worth it. I see her showing the unit to another smart mark. I hold my cool, I wait for her to finish with her newest printer. I make my way over to the house to confront her. As soon as she sees me, she starts to wail about how the tenant changed their mind, blah blah blah. And that's why she couldn't trend to me. I've heard enough. I square my stance directly opposite this clearly upset charlatan. Now you listen to me. You will get me $900 as required by law by the end of the day, or I will go directly to the police station and let them deal with you. She turned white. For a minute I thought she was going to puke on the ground right there in front of me. She says, hold on. I will get you your money. I remember thinking, heck, that was easier than I thought. She goes upstairs. The unit was a basement unit in the house she was living in. I kid you not, hands me a wad of cash and says, here. This is ruining my Christmas, but here. She almost pushed me off balance as she jammed the messy wad of cash into me. Um, thank you. Good day. I say and take the money, count it, and walk away. I didn't turn around and look back. I got on the first bus that stopped nearby heading back toward the direction of my friend's house. Not until I was home did I calm down and realize it was going to be a sweet Christmas. All thanks to a lion phony cheapskate. However, this is not the end of the revenge. About a week later, I got a phone call from a friend asking me if the lady in the news is the same crazy lady I got the double damage deposit from. I'm like, what? Sure enough, it turns out this lady was running the same scam in parallel with a bunch of other victims. I am mortified. Not just because I almost got scammed, but, but it immediately occurs to me that the money I got was someone else's money. And they are homeless for the holidays. I head right down to the police station where there is, I kid you not, a line of crime people filing reports about being scammed by this woman. I feel awful. When it's my turn, I get to the intake officer and start to give my story. I lay it all down, how I fell for it, how I sticked out the rental to confront her, my demand of double the money back, my threats of legal action against her, and finally the skillful execution of the law by getting double the deposit back. I tell the cop I took some of the money that belonged to the other victims, and she looks at me and says, man, you were the only one smart enough to confront her in a reasonable way. You earned that money. Don't worry about it. A young lady who was now homeless and desperate couldn't tell but over here. And as I was leaving the police station, she approached me and said, Hey, did you get your money back from that witch? To which I sheepishly replied, Actually, I got double my deposit from her when I threatened her with the police. The girl blinks a couple of times and finally grins, starts a slow clap, and announces to the other victim still waiting to give a statement in the lobby of the police station, this guy took her for double the damage deposit. I cringed. But then, in the most unexpected turn of events, the line of victims began applauding. I suppose was a realization that while their money was gone, someone had really screwed her back. And that made them happy. They cheered. I felt better. The cops laughed and we all, there had to be 20 people in all, had a joyful cosmic moment of holiday shot and Freud at her expense. I left the police station with a clean conscience and a smile on my face, and I enjoyed every last penny of that witch's nasty stack. We were living in a condo complex on the second floor, and my downstairs neighbor was this older couple. The lady had a heart condition, so she was always in and out of the hospital, and I did my best to be respectful of her needs. I have four kids, and unfortunately, when you choose to live in a ground level unit, you have to deal with upstairs noise. I am pretty strict about how my kids play inside, so if there was ever excessive noise, it didn't last long. Every now and then, the lady would text me asking if everything was okay, and it was always just a tantrum. Back in August, my husband's maternal grandmother died, and we were not informed, much less invited to the funeral. It's a whole thing, so to help his siblings through their grief, we offered to host a lunch for his siblings after they went to the graveside and did a little meeting there. I wanted to clean my Porsche off because hello, four kids are super messy. I texted my neighbor and very politely but firmly said, hey, we're going to be cleaning our Porsche, so if there is anything you don't want getting wet, move it out of the way. Well, she didn't like that at all. Threw a huge fit and had her husband come up and try to bully us. 
her grandkids had drawn in chalk on her patio and we were just gonna wash it all away. How horrible of us. Her husband ends up saying, we will report it to the HOA and deal with it that way. I was so irritated. We ended up not cleaning the Porsche due to some other circumstances, but they had already sent in their complaint. Next week rolls by and I get a letter in the mail from the HOA basically saying, you have to keep your Porsche clean or we will fine you. In comes the malicious compliance. I texted my neighbor and let her know that we got the letter and I will be cleaning the Porsche that day so she needed to get all her stuff moved. She was all huffy. Oh no, you can't do that today. I can't move anything. I'll talk to my husband. A while later she texts and says, he's coming home early to move everything. He's not happy. Oh, I wish we could have done this on a Saturday like I had planned last week. Sucks to suck, lady. It felt so glorious spraying off my Porsche knowing she was downstairs complaining about it because I could hear her phone conversation. First, a little backstory. I'm a college student and cycle to campus every day. It's not a long ride at all, but I have to go through a zone where it's illegal to ride a bicycle on a sidewalk, so I'm forced to ride on the road. Most drivers don't care and just go around me since I stay to the edge and don't make myself a nuisance. Also, I have a crabby e-bike that I commute on. This will be important later. A few weeks ago, a guy in a Ford SUV, I don't know exactly which kind, started yelling at me as he drove by while I was in the road-only zone. Oh, the usual get out of the road, roads are for car, you're too slow kind of stuff. I get that from drivers on a weekly basis, I just ignore and keep going. This man was special though, since he got right in front of me and slammed on his brakes after yelling. I was able to stop before I hit him, and he floored it out of there yelling, better be careful next time, bike. I was pretty mad, but I hadn't got his license plate or anything, and I doubt anything could be done about it anyway. There was no real proof. Over lunch, I told one of my friends who works as an EMT the story, and he got seriously pissed off. Apparently, he has seen the results of a car successfully brake checking on a cyclist, and they aren't pretty. Two days later, the same Ford SUV jerk tried to brake check me again. I was expecting it as soon as I heard him yelling, Get on the sidewalk, bike! from behind. So, I avoided the crash again. I told my EMT friend over lunch again and he was even madder than before. I wanted to let it go, since I can't really do anything about him and my bicycle isn't going to win in a crash. This guy keeps trying to brake check me every few days during my morning commute, whenever we're on the same patch of road at the same time. About a week ago, my EMT friend told me that he told my story to one of his friends in the campus police, who was equally pissed off. The two of them wanted to catch this jerk driver. The plan was to have the policeman parked on the side of the road in hopes of catching and pulling over the jerk. I heartily agreed, and the officer pulled some strings and had himself posted on speeder catching duty for that stretch of road. A few days passed uneventfully, there was no signs of the road rager. I saw the cop parked in the same spot on the side of the road every day, a spot where the road has a left turn lane in a straight lane. Finally, I am pedaling along and I hear the familiar voice scream. Get the hell out of the road, jerk! I yelled back, catch me then, and I took off. I was spinning my scrawny little chicken legs as hard as they would go and pegged the throttle. I guess this made the driver even madder because I heard his engine roar as he pursued me. He shifted into the left lane as I stayed in the right. I looked to the side and saw a nasty old man in a driver's seat with a passenger window open. His mouth was going like he was yelling, but I couldn't hear him over the wind noise. I saw the police car spot approaching and started to slow down. Taking the opportunity, the driver swung right in front of me. I don't know if it was the speed or his anger that made him swing wide, but he cut across my lane and crashed straight into the back of the police car. I barely applied my brakes, slowed down to about 50 miles per hour, and crashed into the side of his car. The officer got out, spitting mad would be an understatement, and called an ambulance and another police car. Everyone was unhurt since the jerk was going only like 25 miles per hour, 
but there was enough of an impact to trigger the SUV's airbag. The jerk ended up getting arrested for driving drunk. Seriously, who drinks before 9 am? For an illegal lane change and probably other stuff too. I don't know all the details. I imagine that causing a crash like that would entail some additional charges. The guy ended up having to pay for extensive repairs on a police cruiser and for a new bike to replace the one he destroyed by cutting in front of me. The frame snapped. On top of that, I hear that his car was defined as total by his insurance company since the airbags went off. So he also has to pay for a new car. With any luck, he will lose his license from the drunk driving charges and won't be able to menace cyclists again.